Hello and welcome to Release Date Rewind. My name is Mark J. Parker and I am a film lover, filmmaker, film celebrator. And normally this is an audio podcast wherever you get your podcasts on your favorite apps. But thanks to Portland Media Center, you are about to watch the video component of this show where I celebrate movie anniversaries with my friends. Each month, I usually talk about two different movies that I love with different friends. And we talk about the making of the movies, trivia, any fun memories associated with them. So I hope you enjoy because now it's time to rewind. Their friend Bill Murray, who's so good in this what oh a fun God. what a fun like understated role because you know he can be i just finally watched scrooged over the weekend oh, for christmas my absolute other favorite i i again i had been wanting to watch that for years and i somehow missed it and wow what a what a great late 80s weird you know like i feel like that and beetlejuice make a great combo just because they're so loud yeah. and wild you know yeah um but yeah what, it was just so fun to see bill murray in a role where he's not shouting you know he's very his humor is flat and dry and really good but anyway yeah. but i did think it was weird we never saw the play we see the sign at the yeah. end you know yeah. it says their names on the on the marquee but yeah we don't ever see terry again and i was like wait she's the lady i think most of us actually care about i don't know right i would not be surprised if it, there was something that they cut for time that deleted scene yeah i wouldn't be surprised and i don't have that on record like i I, I agree with you that I wanted to see her one more time as well. Right. Um, yeah, just to see how how did the play turn out? Because mm -hmm. she's, you know, we know what he's doing to her. We know, we see her waiting and all the mixed signals. So it's like, well, yeah, let me catch up with her one last time to see that she's doing well. Yeah, you know? and that like, you know, the, the woman that we see who's anxious and nervous and having trouble accessing her anger is really able to do that on stage. Because I think it's like, if you give her that small success, um, we, can, we can't forgive Michael wholeheartedly, but we at least are like, ah, but she's in the play and everyone's loving her and she's fantastic, right? Yeah. Even if it was just like one moment where you see them being like fantastic right. you know, on stage together. Um, I think it's a really good point um, because I do think that is such a classic, you know, exasperation scene of like, you know, her, her last speech. It's so, oh. it's, I mean, it's also what got her nominated, I'm sure. Right. Um, I mean, the whole performance, but I'm sure that was one that they, they probably showed or thought of, you know, when she was getting nominated. Yeah. But yeah, I agree. Um, I think she gets a little bit of a shortage. Now, do you think Jessica Lange deserved the Oscar or? Oh my gosh. Well, I let's, let's, do you have it up there? If I'm remembering correctly, based on what I'm I read. I'm going to Google the other nominees as we're talking. It was close in the world according to Garp. And I know okay. this because um, I did not discover until the other day that Terry Garr had written a memoir. Um, oh. And now I have to buy it, but I oh. was able to, um, you know, uh, borrow it quickly from my library oh, online nice. ebook so I could look at it before we were talking. Oh my gosh, you're such a great researcher. Wow. Oh, well, thanks. I mean, but when I realized I'm, I am truly like a real fan of hers. Like I yeah. love her. I want a t-shirt with her on it. Like I, <laughs> her and Beverly D'Angelo are two of my favorite. What a duo. Actors. I would love to see the two of them in something today, oh right? Forget oh, book club. Exactly. But so her book is called Speed Bumps, Terry Gar, And she talks about how she thought Glenn Close was going to win for World According to Garp because right. it would her and Jessica would cancel would, out. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. But also Meryl Streep was nominated for Sophie's Choice. Yes, for lead. For lead. Oh, that's what yes. it is. So she, she won. Was, okay, so tell me, tell me who else was in the supporting actor. Character. So supporting actress Jessica and Terry Glenn Close, Kim Stanley, who was in Francis, which <gasps> funny enough starred Jessica Lang, yep. and just I didn't realize Jessica was nominated twice that year yeah. for both lead for Francis and then supporting for uh, Tootsie. So Kim Stanley and then Leslie Ann Warren for Victor Victoria. Oh my gosh, Victor Victoria was that year. How funny! Another Crazy. another switched identity. Yes gender bending yeah now it doesn't look like victor victoria actually had that many knobs because this one had like 10 nominations this mm -hmm. was a big and of course made a ton of money i mean it was yes number one for like 13 weeks or something but yeah it's funny how this was the more prominent gender bending you know yeah <laughs> mistaken identity one yeah but wow yeah jessica won which is also interesting and i'll i'll tell you now a little bit about 
just a few of our kind of main players where they were in their careers. I yes. forgot. I, I guess I never realized Jessica Lang was still kind of new at acting. It's I did not realize her debut was King Kong only about what six years prior to this. Wow. So wow, she I guess I guess because what did she start out as a model? I think she, she might did. have. I mean, I know that Gina Davis definitely got the role in this because she was a model. Right, and um, she's so fun in her little her role little and skimpy. The, <laughs> yeah, so skimpy. But but you know, it it didn't feel um, exploitative to me because it's just reminding. Michael mm -hmm. as Dorothy that like oh my god we are not the same banging into the door you know like it's just some great physical yeah. comparison you know um but yeah Gina and and so yeah I, I was just looking at uh Jessica Lang's filmography and I was like oh wow yeah she she had done some movies but not as many as others I mean Dustin Hoffman was already nominated a bunch uh for Oscars mm -hmm. and had already won for mm -hmm. Kramer versus Kramer, right? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I guess in my mind, I just thought, oh yeah, Jessica Lange had been around for a long time, but really she wasn't. So maybe she just was the the hot kind of like, I'm trying to envision who she'd be like now or who's like an Oscar winner. Maybe you remember like um, Alicia Vikander won oh, that yeah. one year. You know, I feel like she did even less than, you know, the movies Jessica Lange had done, but like maybe someone like that. I was just sort of trying to like relate it to someone we know nowadays. You know, you know what I'm thinking of? I think it's kind of a connected to Charlize Theron mm. when, when she was nominated for Cider House Rules. It was like, I don't know how much she had done before that. And That's then, interesting. Yeah. You know, it was kind of like, who is this gorgeous? dame <laughs> right yeah that's a really interesting comparison yeah that's right because cider house came out before monster which is what mm -hmm. she won for yeah oh yeah yeah so that's a good comparison blonde beauty who's yeah. really good yeah. and doesn't take all that long to kind of become like yeah. a list award winner right exactly exactly and um and i think too that the based on the notes i you know heard from elaine mays talking about it and some of the other little blurbs um, Jessica Lang was so loved for her theater work. Um, oh, okay. and because she was together with Sam Shepard and Sam Shepard was such a big part of the, the theater yeah. world that it was like known in the New York scene that, you know, she's a, an actor, you know, ah, and okay. it was one of the reasons they were like, oh, let's see what she can do with a little bit of comedy and up against Dustin, who's also right you know, such an actor. Exactly. Um, yes. You know, so that makes sense. <laughs> yes. So I think that's also a little bit where it came from, where it's like, Ooh, who's the buzz on, who's the buzz in the like theater world, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And we, we see that from a lot of the other actors mm -hmm. who are, are in this piece, you know? Um, although it's very interesting with timing with Bill Murray, because I feel like, Hey, you can mm -hmm. argue with me guys and um, feel free to comment when, when you hear this, but for me, that's the first time I think Bill Murray is really clinching into like what his cinematic persona became. Mm. Because mm. before that, he's on TV, he's doing SNL, mm -hmm. he's got a few little bit parts here and there. But for me, it's like the combination of that writing plus Bill Murray. Because, you know, like once again, Caddyshack, he's playing such a goof. Right. Like it's a goof. But this is that acerbic, clever, like, you know, deadpan. Yeah. Deadpan. Yes. That becomes this guy we see for years and years, up and even until Lost in Translation, even up until, you know, right. um, he's in the Wes Anderson films. That is his kind of, you know, perfect combo, um, yeah. you know, um, his persona that he puts on. And I, th I think that's also why, for me, it's because, you know, the next movie he does that I think, even though it's a goofy movie, it's one of the best movies of that era, which is Ghostbusters. Right. That came like, out two years later. Yeah. I feel like he's pulling in some of this guy into that, that yes. Ghostbusters character. Sort of like emotionless comedy. Like he yeah. keeps a pretty straight face in a lot of these movies, but yeah. just lets the lines do their thing. Yeah. I have it here. So obviously Tootsie was 82. Uh, the year before he was in Stripes. Oh, Stripes. 19, 1980 was Caddyshack. And then before that, 79 was Meatballs. So it was, yeah. Earlier. Yeah. I mean, he's definitely, I mean, he, he, there is, I mean, in stripes, there's some of that wryness for sure. But mm -hmm. with the, I don't know if you've seen those movies lately, I think they're, they're just not as, um, he's just not as dry. Mm -hmm. And I think that dryness for me is where I really like see him finding the good match, but it could just be me because, you know, I also love all the kind of movies you just mentioned that came out before and watched them. Right. 
over and over and over again. And, um, but for here, it's like, it, it's like what I really love about Bill Murray yeah. performances and even in Scrooged, um, right. even though it is much bigger, there's still that idea of like, you know, the guy who like the joke comes out the side of his mouth. He's right. Not, he's not always broadcasting the joke. Right? Yes. Uh huh. Um, that is one nutty hospital. I mean, this movie took some time to get made as well. Yes, it definitely um, like switched directors, right? I was reading yeah. that Sidney Pollack came in later. Like you said, it was already Dustin Hoffman was already not only the star, but had exerted some creative control. Yeah, some, and I think right? I think you had Hal Ashby, which would have been fascinating. You know, um, you probably know him best for Harold and Maud, right. like a very different tone. And Sidney Pollack has talked about this being was a little hard for him because he doesn't consider himself a comedic director. But mm. I think that might also be why the movie is so successful is that he's, he's, I think really directing it with a straight bent. Like right. this is this to him is it's not playing to the joke. Um, like the camera isn't playing to the joke. The camera is connecting to it as a, as a kind of straight drama, yeah. um, which might be why it works. But apparently, you know, Dustin Hoffman's a hard guy to work with. Um, I didn't know that much about that until looking into it for this movie. I, um, I know there was some stuff in his older age that I've heard about, right? Right. Mm -hmm. But uh, because he was so prolific, um, as someone I saw so much as a young person in all yeah. kinds of movies, I just didn't know that that was that he was difficult. And because this was his baby, um, you know, that Hal Ashby left. They fired Larry Gelbart, who was mm. one of the main writers on the piece um, that yeah. had brought Elaine in. Um, to do more notes and you know Sidney Pollack talked about how Dustin drove him crazy wow. um, you know throughout the whole production it was just like you know hurdle after hurdle of you know this isn't how it should be this should be like this and Ugh. um but you know that's also what's kind of amazing about the subtext of the movie is that it's about difficult a difficult actor yeah um, and how perfect then for Sidney Pollack to play his agent. I know. And I love Sidney as the agent. Those are some of my favorite scenes. They're, oh my gosh, brilliant, brilliant yes. stuff. Like even before Michael gets himself in this whole situation, their back and forth is great. And then later and the whole reveal, I think it's at the Russian tea room, right? Yeah. Where like, oh, I love you that know, scene. excuse me, oh, you know, my. oh my gosh. It's Michael Dorsey. God, I begged you to get some therapy. And I, I read somewhere, maybe you did too, that Dabney Coleman, I guess, was actually the actor in mind for the agent to the, oh. to the point where I, I read somewhere that in their drafts of, of rewriting and revising, they had Dabney in mind for, for Michael's agent. But <gasps> no, I guess- No, that's so interesting. I guess somehow Sydney, I, I feel like I read that Dustin actually said, Sydney, you should be the agent and we save Dabney for, you know, the director, which Dabney's great as the director. Oh my gosh. You know, that's another one of these- for me, unsung heroes of the of yes. 80s cinema is Dabney Coleman. I think mm -hmm. he is so fantastic in everything he does. And even though he's playing a total creep, um, he is so good at being um, beyond a caricature. And yeah, he, he felt very real to me. Like that's how a director would be, especially, you know, someone who's been at this for a while. He would mm -hmm. be just like that, like kind of a dick, but like, not mm -hmm. a n more than just that, you know? Oh, yeah. absolutely. And the way he, you know, interacts with the crew and the, and there was a lot of women, there was a women, a woman AD and a, there's a woman, you know, producer. Yes. Um, I love the producer. I, yeah, what's her, what is that actress's name? Doris Bellack as Rita. I love Rita. Me too. Love right? her. But I think it's like, that was so smart in so many different ways to see how he reacts to all these different like women around him, um, including the starlets and how yes. he reacts to them. And um, yeah, I just think I, you're so right. There's a humanity he brings to it that feels very realistic right. and um, and still super funny. Although you, he's on your hit list. Like you know, you're not totally. You're not you're not cheering for him, but you're still oh, yeah. enjoying all of the the fun yeah and that's what's just so interesting that 40 years ago this movie was talking about you know creepy male directors yeah. you know not treating their female stars well and so i just wonder what people thought of that at the time i bet a lot of people were like yep i've been there but it seems like nothing really changed for a while 
No, right? I think it's like, isn't it so funny how you could still, people were still holding a mirror to things right? and they were the, sometimes the butt of a joke, but it wasn't something that was necessarily encouraging change. Um, right. It was kind of almost like, I think in some ways, the reason that it becomes the butt of the joke is because it's something that everyone is so used to that it is so commonplace that it's like, ha, huh, well, if you're, if you, if you can't laugh at it, then what are you going to do? Right. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Where yeah, I do feel like if you were, if we're going to compare, which I already, of course, did the comparison with Dabney's part in nine to five and mm. in, in Tootsie that in nine to five, it's so obvious that they're, they're really trying to say, we have to change this. Like we, we can't just, you know, let this happen. And I think in Tootsie, it's more like, oh, this is just the way it is. And mm, uh, we're just, yeah. re we're just going to get through it. Um, Interesting. You know? yeah. And, and I mean, I also just think, you know, you're someone who has been acting, performing theaters, television, film, since you were young, mm -hmm. that there's also a different kind of um, backstage banter and backstage behavior um, that I think has been kind of a, and that's what's so tricky about the Me Too movement that has been ignored in a much bigger way than I think in some other corporations because it's, mm. oh, that's just how it is. You know, artists, actors, it's all like we're a family and these things happen. And, you know, right. you know what I'm talking about, oh, right? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is a good um, example of how it was just so easy for people just to like be like, oh, that's just what I have to deal with. Or just yeah. seeing the witnessing of them being like, this is what it's like to work my job. Totally. Um, you know? Yeah. And it's a really, I quite liked how it doesn't take us long once we meet Julie, Jessica Lang's character, while she's working, which I thought was just cool anyway to kind of, because yeah. that's kind of when we really, you know, are getting to meet her, that right off the bat, she's sort of rolling her eyes or like letting us know, like, she doesn't like that, you know, but she's sort of stuck. Michael, there are no other women like you. You're a man. Yes, I realize that, of course, but I'm also an actress. Tootsie <laughs> kisses Julie, and it's like, oh, God, you know, Dorothy's gay, you yeah. know, which then becomes a whole nother issue, which is so funny. But Another layer on a layer. But, <laughs> and then it does get a little, there's a slight sense of homophobia there, but it's, I don't think it's that Julie, you know, when she's like, we shouldn't be friends. I don't think it's because she thinks Dorothy's gay. I think it's just life's already complicated and you know you have led my dad on and i just feel like you know you know what i mean yes i do know what you mean yeah mm -hmm. yeah it's not it's not blatant about her being attracted to her it's yeah. about the kind of like you're saying the the circumstances surrounding it um right. that she's feeling that but i think it's also like you know you know screenwriting 101 is what is the worst thing that can happen to your protagonist, you know, at the end of the second act based on what they're kind of working toward at the end of the first act. And mm -hmm. in this case, I really love the fact that I don't know exactly how they're going to get there, but that everything crashes down on Michael slash Dorothy, um, you know, including that the, you know, profession of love of a kiss gets completely thwarted. Um, you know, so, I mean, I understand that there might be some, underhanded thought of a uh, homophobia there. But for me, it's like, like you were talking too about him in his the desire to act and be respected as an actor is so important to him that he'll go to these kind of lengths. Um, it's the same thing with that, where it's like the respect, you know, his, his gumption and bravado to like go this far to have a part and then, you know, try to also, you know, connect to his, his, you know, base, the secret guy inside uh, his human wow. connection is of course going to be a complete disaster. Um, it can't succeed. You know, it can't like it literally can't. Um, yeah. I think she's mostly just shocked and hurt because I mean, as we see dad is proposing to Dorothy, right? Oh he, he's got the ring and they're out at whatever, <laughs> wherever Copacabana or I don't know some, you know, and right. And so, Oh my God, I just, <laughs> I, I wish I had a camera. Next time I'll I'll have a camera on me because I was like along for the ride with this movie. I was Ooh. laughing and it was just me in the room and and gasping and like like how is Dorothy gonna get out of this? How is Michael gonna you know? Yeah. Oh, so good. And that's the beauty of it too is that uh, I think that part of the of the element of the the spine of the story is still really strong and works. Um, you know, even if you 
don't like certain things or you have issues with certain things, you can't deny that you are along for the ride. The building of the world, mm-hmm. it, just think about it too. You know, um, we've had a lot of behind the scenes movies, but I think with Tootsie, what's another thing I think is amazing is that it's the world of Michael's world. And then there's Dorothy's world. So you have two worlds you have to kind of, you know, introduce right away. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's so seamless and easy. When we're introduced to the world of um, was it Southern, what's it called? <laughs> oh, uh, I think it's Southwest General, <laughs> Southwest right? Southwest General. Yeah, when we're introduced yes. to the world of the set of Southwest General, it's seamless how we get to meet everybody because it's all happening in action. They're already shooting something. Like she's trying to get attention, you know, in yeah. that moment. And um, it, for me, there's like so many very specific story technical elements that they do so well um, yes. that it's worth taking a look at it, even if you're not someone who's interested in comedy or you think there are questionable things going on in it, just in the the basics. Kind of like I also say to folks when they will ask me about introducing lots of characters at the beginning of a movie and how tricky it can be. And I'm like, well, I think that Tootsie does that in a way too, that is kind of you don't notice that it's happening Mm -hmm. um you know you meet his world his theater world and the players in it so quickly Mm -hmm. and they have that party always so smart whenever you can anybody listening if you are writing a screenplay and you're trying to figure out how to introduce your world so quickly it's like have a gathering yeah everybody's there (laughs) um and uh it's then then you can kind of meet the world and see what kind of player he is in the world as well Mm -hmm. and then same with you know, getting to the studio set, it's like everybody in one place already at work doing it. We get so much so quickly. Um, and then we can start into the problem, you yeah. know, that he got the part and and now what? And like now what we're going to have fun with the, it's kind of like what I love too about the problem being raised here at the end of the first act is that it's actually a huge victory, but mm. the victory presents so many problems, yes. right? Yes, it's so amazing, like, yeah. but it's also awful. Like, yes. no, you know, yeah. I so wish that I, so far uh, as a writer, had come up with something that was like, oh my God, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. And oh my God, I I have no idea how I'm going to. And then later when, when Rita tells Dorothy, you know, you're, you're a star, we want to renew your contract. It's like, wow, but also no. And he's he's begging his agent, you got to get me out of this. And meanwhile, Sydney Pollock's like, are you crazy? Like, no. The best thing ever happened to you. Yes. I mean, oh, yeah. The, the predicament of it is so fun that way. Um, and I think that's why it's always been a classic storytelling uh, trope is the mistaken identity. Because yeah. it just puts characters in such an absolute, hurt, like, conundrum yeah. so many times during the story. And that's where we get really excited as an audience. We're like, oh, hey, yeah. how? Because when he sleeps with Sandy... Mm-hmm. It's only because I mean that is brilliant, but I but I your heart is immediately breaking because it's like no, you are you are sending this girl down the wrong path. But he's he's in her room, right, trying on her like I know the clothes, like, the dress. clothes and stockings and all that, and then she comes out of the shower, and he's just like I want you, you know, like ah, oh, it's it's so brilliant. But like yeah, there are so many moments that have that double edged sword where mm-hmm. oh genius, but oh god, the the effect of this is. Yeah. Yeah. But I could see too, if I'm writing that scene, I would not put it past me at all for my main character to be as terrible to mm-hmm. someone in their life because of their overarching goal and the, the mistaken identity, the, you know, um, the kind of conundrum that they're in. I would totally, I don't know if I would do the exact same thing, but I could see myself going, oh, that's, that's the, that's going to be the most difficult thing is getting caught yeah. doing something like this. How do you get out of it? Right. right. Um, and what would that guy do? Of course he would do that. That's what the right. character would do. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, as, as cruel as it is. Um, but I think there's also something about the time period that we're in where uh, there is a sense. And this is I know this is um, gets a little bit more so a little bit later. But the, you know, AIDS crisis was kind of early days. Right. There was still a lot more like promiscuity in general being promoted in movies and TV um, in the late seventies, early eighties, where it was, you know, I think culturally probably wouldn't have been seen as such a terrible thing that he slept with her Mm. um, in that, you know, everybody sleeps with everybody kind of thing, you know, except for the fact that she really likes him. I know. know, Obviously, which is the, (laughs) which, Which, you know, thinking about it, 
Do you think she actually does like him or does she just like the attention? You know, like, and I don't, I don't no. mean that in a negative way, just like, you know, that her acting coach and friend does view her as sort of the star yeah. of his life. Like, you know, I wonder, cause again, we don't get to, see, I think the last time I realized the last time we actually see her is that great little moment where, of course, the end when Michael reveals himself on yeah. live TV, right? Because well, again, no, Cece, what, <laughs> what amazing writing. Rita, uh, our girl Rita comes back <laughs> in and she's like, well, our editor fell asleep and half the, you know. Uh, well, we have to go said, live. Yes, we have to, we have to do half this episode live, you know, and how brilliant that then it's like, okay, here's this problem and I'm going to just go off script. And so that's the last time we see Sandy is she's watching it. That's she's hate watching, watching right? Because yeah. earlier she says like, I hate that actress. Yeah. She's <laughs> awful, right? But she's watching every episode and she, I think is eating, right? And is, and drops her food and, and like kind of does a little scream seeing that that's Michael on TV. So, yeah, I just would have loved, I actually feel like I would love the ending to be Terry Gar and Jessica Lang walking off together oh, to be like, be yeah, this guy, right? Anyway, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. Like, who needs, who needs that? Like, you know, now, you know, Terry's on the show or doing her own thing. Oh, yeah. Jessica yeah, could yeah. be like, oh, you're an actress? Oh, I can help you get in. And it's like, should have just talked to her, not this guy, right? Or something. Like, well, yeah, I, you know, I just I, feel like that's a fun Going back to that fantasy. original question, which is, does she really like him? I think about the toast at the party at the very beginning. Right. And she's saying to Michael, and really what she's saying is to a really like fantastic actor and coach, right? And not necessarily saying to me anything that connects to the fact that like, like, you know, her crush on him. Mm. I feel like it's so much more about being reverent to what he does to help her. And same with yeah. when, you know, he's taking her home from the party and she's so upset and she's worried about the audition and helping her. It doesn't feel like to me that mm -hmm. her heart is on her sleeve and, and she has this thing. I think it's like, you know, the way that you think you have a crush on your teacher who's so fantastic at what they do or is such a great actor. It's like, of course she would want to date Michael because he's the director and he's so fantastic and she takes his class. But mm -hmm. like, I think you're right. I think maybe it's also because Terry Gar is such a great actress. Hey guys, if Terry Gar, if you're listening, like we love you, <gasps> Terry uh -huh. Gar fan club. But um, that, you know, she's nuanced. Mm -hmm. She wants to be an actress so badly herself. And she's also a single girl in New York and he's a hot commodity. So of course she's going to, that would be great for her. Yeah. Maybe it's not so sad and, mournful you know but it's just that kind of like comedic trope of like the kind of like foiled again like, mm -hmm. you know, like single girl foiled again <laughs> yes <laughs> but she did say that you know at that time even though she didn't win the oscar she never thought she would get nominated for an oscar for a role like that either wow yeah. it wasn't something in her mind but she said that you know her career was blazing. She had a really great house in the hills. She was a regular on The Tonight Show and Late Night with David Letterman. Mm. She was on the cover of Ms. Magazine. And in The New Yorker, Pauline Kael, who I also love uh, her your views of movies, called her the funniest neurotic ditzy dame on the screen. Mm, that does ring a bell. Okay. She was really kind of like, just like blazing. She was just happy to be kind of out there doing it. But it feels to me a little bit like the character in <laughs> Tootsie yes. that, you know, she kind of was never the leading lady, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, she was always a supporting character, yeah. um, even though she was nominated for an Oscar, you right. know? Thanks so much for watching. Next time, there's gonna be a new movie that we'll talk about, so stay tuned. And please follow Release Date Rewind on Instagram for updates. Bye.